Kiri, you had another uh, tragedy up at the Vic Falls. Um, just tell us what, what happened up there. We had up at the falls, um, on the, those people who have been there will know it, there is a rifle range up at the falls. And we stored our mines on the rifle range. And what we'd had is one of our bulldozers had come in and dug uh, a very deep, call it trench, not too wide, but with a shallow incline, very deep. And the mines that were being laid in the area of Vic Falls were stored there. The mines that we used, the anti-personal mines, we had various mines. We had mines from South Africa. We had local mines. There was Portuguese mines. There was all sorts of varying mines. At this time, one of the mines that we were using locally was what we called a carrot mine because it did look like a, a carrot. It was sort of a vertical thing there. Now, there had been some accidental detonations in other parts of the country some time back, and it was determined that the locally produced carrot mine was unstable. The amount of carrot mines up at the falls, I can't tell you the exact amount. Eventually, the directive came from the army. Uh, all, all mines are to be deactivated and produced and uh, brought back to, to Salisbury, to Nkomo Barracks. What they were going to do with them, I don't know. So the exercise was then undertaken. And a 20-tonner from uh, our unit came up there, parked off next to where the big trench is, and a combination of Officers and senior NCOs then undertook the deactivating of these carrot mines to then be placed on the back of the 20 tonner and be transported back to Salisbury. It was very, very carefully, proficiently and efficiently run. On top of the cab of the 20 tonner, uh, so he had the vision, was a national service subby of mine, uh, John, John Sullivan, uh, no, John Carlisle, I think it was anyway. He could see what was going on. There were other officers around and senior NCOs. And the idea was two people brought a box out from within the, um, the, where, where, the, where the mines were kept because if there had been an explosion, it would have gone straight upright. They then took, when it was ready, that box 20, 30 meters further down to two more guys who were now deactivating these mines. Two more guys would then take that deactivated box all the way around a long trip and put it on the back of the 20 tonner. That's just the simple way of describing what happened. So if you can imagine where the box came out of the, uh, the, the earth trench, there was a slight downhill slope. The two guys furthest away from everybody were deactivating and then two guys would bring them back because obviously it was just too much for one guy to handle. And the operation was going along and had been going along for some time and Everybody was keeping an eye on everything because they knew damn well that these mines were very sensitive. Suddenly, a detonation took place. The box of mines at the top of the lip where the trench was, for no apparent reason, detonated. The two guys either side, they just disappeared, as it were, in the blast. Eventually, the Board of Inquiry worked out the blast wave traveled down and detonated the following box below there with those guys handling it. The overall aspect was that seven guys were killed. It was the most number of casualties the Corps suffered in one incident. Uh, the Board of Inquiry, in no time at all, the very next day, Mike Pelham and a whole lot of guys from Army Headquarters were up there and full investigation to take place. I wouldn't say they were looking for a scapegoat at all. They were looking at the safety measures that had been implemented there. And then the Board of Inquiry was formed. And again, they took statements from the survivors. They took measurements, tape measures, this thing, that thing, you name it. And the eventual outcome of the Board of Inquiry was no one person could be held responsible for a lack of safety. Safety had been adhered to throughout. The end conclusion an act of God. Nobody knows what set off that box on top of the lip to detonate. Nobody was touching it. Nobody was actually handling it and call it sympathetic detonation, which they were considered was too far away for the next box. And if it had been on a level plane, probably wouldn't have detonated. It was just that it was on a slight downhill. So yes, 
very unfortunate. We lost a couple of senior NCOs, um, but effectively at the end of the day, nobody could be held responsible for lack of safety. Safety was paramount throughout, purely and simply an act of God. Terry, um, staying at the falls, um, something that I think very few people know about, but um, how the engineers got involved in trying to forestall a, a potential conventional attack um, using the Vic Falls Bridge. Just um, tell us about the measures that you were involved in taking to, um, to prevent that happening. About early 79, um, we got the instructions to go and, dare I say, place explosive charges on the Falls Bridge to take out the bridge in the event that particularly a Zipra armored column uh, was going to use the Falls Bridge to come across, obviously take out the falls and then head down to Wanky, etc. So we looked at aspects, went up there, did a recce and said, right, Fortunately for us, the headquarters of Rhodesian Railways is in Bulawayo. And one of our TA officers, Des Clarsons, uh, was a fairly senior chap in the, in the railways there. We went down to the railways and said, is there any chance you can help us? They brought out the original drawings from about 1903. Yeah. All in imperial units. I mean, monstrous pieces of paper. So we had the definitive dimensions of all the steelwork on the bridge. And supposedly, <laughs> I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, um, but on one of these drawings there, Cecil Rhodes had written to North and Cairo. Somebody had written it on the drawing. Anyway, Des, a lovely man, he was so cooperative and helped us immensely, and my squadron sergeant major at the time, uh, a real Scotsman of note, Arthur Pollock, he liaised with the railways people, and we sat there and took the dimensions of the bridge, the girders, and so on and so forth, and said, right, let's sit down and try and work out what the amount of explosives is needed, and we determined that, call it the second span from the home bank, is what we were going to drop into the river. Uh, that would obviously, uh, the, the integrity of the bridge was then totally taken apart because there was nothing to support anything. It would now be floating in, in midair. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is if you take out a bridge and it's got, call it, concrete abutments and things and you've got a span in the middle, the idea is you take it out. Well, if the enemy comes along, they can bridge across there because they've got definitive supports to put an improvised bridging thing on. With the bridge at the falls, with it being an arched steel, thing, you take out some of those uh, steel bits there, the integrity is such, this thing's going to flop around in the breeze. You can't just do a quick bridging exercise there. Anyway, unbeknown to us, Des got a hold of Arthur Pollock and said, listen, I think we can go one better. There's some leftover steel from the bridge behind the railway's workshop. <laughs> You've actually got some leftover steel from the... Uh, production on the bridge and everything. He said, yes, we got some steel. So we were very fortunate and took this steel out to the range and we tested, call it our calculations on steel cutting charges. Uh, good British steel without <laughs> being too complimentary to them and thicker than we anticipated. Suddenly our calculations were actually not working that wonderfully. It wasn't cutting the steel. So we took our calculations, took this, took that, and added about 20%. And then we worked out, now we can cut the steel. Uh, so yes, very fortunate with Des helping us on that lot. Then the next thing was we had to look at, uh, and people without being derogatory who understand explosives, if you're cutting steel, you actually want uh, a cutting motion opposite each other. So you've got a bit of explosive here, a bit of explosive here, and they work against each other and it cuts the steel. Because of the configuration of the bridge, we couldn't put the charges in a cutting configuration. We had to put more explosives in one given area to destroy that section of the steel. So back to the calculations again, and back to some of the leftover steel. The explosives that we were going to be using was uh, PE4, plastic explosive, lovely stuff that got a nice smell to it. 
Uh, there's no nitroglycerine in it, so it's not a hassle handling and getting headaches and things like that. But one of the problems with the operational area, if PE4 is going to be left lying around for a long period of time, is certain animals, not the least of which are baboons, love the taste of PE4. Um, and <laughs> they would have removed all the explosives in no time at all uh, and eaten it to no ill effect. So then back to the drawing board and Dez came back to our rescue and we had made up aluminium boxes at the right configuration to take X number of kgs of explosives, which would then be super glued to the bridge structure. Thereby, obviously the boons couldn't get at the explosives. We did a fair amount of recce work, uh, Arthur Pollock particularly in that area. And we had to be very careful and we had the, let's call it the planning around payday in Zambia and Zambian army payday. Anything to do with payday, we were not seen on the bridge at all. It was just too dangerous. The Canadian tourists had been killed a couple of years before around about payday. Payday comes uh, a few beers and they get trigger happy. So with civilian clothes, the unit that I had formed some years ago, S Troop, we got them up to the falls. And to make a long story short, we placed with super glue these extra large charges on the second span from the home base, as it were, uh, and completed the ring main. The Zambians, as far as we were concerned, just thought we were probably bridge inspectors or something like that. The ring main was then run back up uh, a good couple of hundred meters. And if you know that part of the falls there, there's a tar road that runs parallel to the railway line, very close to the railway line. And then there's a fair expanse of uh, natural bush going off to the gorge. So the Tar Road runs very close to the railway line. We then built a bunker a good couple of hundred meters back with the firing mechanism in the bunker. Uh, the bunker was designed to withstand hopefully a minimum of a direct hit from an 82 millimeter mortar. In the bunker, two responsible sappers um, and the button to press should the need arise that you are going to now uh, drop the second span of the bridge. In conjunction with that, we laid and I stress a dense minefield on the edge of the road going to the gorge using our captured TM mines. So that in the event that a vehicle did manage to cross and went off the tar road, it was going to detonate a mine. And that minefield was very well uh, recorded and marked out. We knew what was there and everything else. Coupled with that, at the time, the road section of the bridge the actual uh, topping of the road had been removed. So there were, um, call it corrugations on the bridge. In, in that sort of aspect, you can say a tracked vehicle would have crossed fine. A wheeled vehicle would have had great difficulty. The guys in the bunker were told, you know, hey, if you see these guys hitting the bridge with their armored vehicles, you press the button. Coupled with, which we'd anticipated, if they sent, call it an infantry unit over to capture our side base and then know that they had nullified the uh, detonating mechanism, uh, they then could have used the bridge to cross. So they were pretty much told 24 hours a day, you keep your eyes and ears open uh, and anything underwater, they've got a radio and anything there, you can check first, failing which you've got to use your initiative because if there's a, a tank on the bridge, it is crossing, press the button. Uh, so the whole of that section of call it the home base of the bridge, was part of the defensive ring for the falls. We also believe that in no time at all, obviously the 25 pounder artilleries and the 90 pounder Elans, they would have been into the fray. But the idea was eventually, if I can put it this way, to delay the crossing sufficiently for a couple of hunters to fly from Thornhill, I don't know what the flying time is, 30 minutes, fully armed and take out that armored column that was now trying to cross the bridge. So. Yes, the bridge was ready to be dropped and we never did press the button. We never knew, never found out if the explosives that we had calculated were going to be sufficient. And then once cessation of hostilities uh, came around, we then dismantled everything off the bridge and then obviously the minefield that was next to the road there. Terry, there was um, at one point 
Uh, you chaps were going to go on the offensive coming out of Becker. Uh, there was an operation planned with the Salu Scouts, I think, to go into um, to go into Zambia and and take the engineers in. What, what was your uh, what was the task and what was your role? I just got an instruction in Bulawayo, jump in a, uh, I think it was a pro aircraft uh, at Heaney Airfield and you're flying up to Decker. And when I got there, there was three group under command of Major Butch Duncan and they were based at Decker. And obviously I'd known Butch for, for many years and chatting away and everything. And I said, okay, sort of words to the effect of what am I doing up here? And he said, oh, we've just had instructions from army, we've got to take out the, the road bridge at Choma. I said, oh, okay. Um, what about the rail bridge? Because <laughs> the two, from Livingston all the way through to Lusaka, you can probably, all the road bridges and the rail bridges are spitting distance from each other. And he said, no, the, the rail bridge has been viewed as an economic uh, target, don't touch it. Uh, but the road bridge uh, is a military target, you can take it out. Uh, we're not to question these uh, instructions from higher up. So I said, okay, fine, where to from here? He said, well, we need to go in and do a recce. What do you need? And I said, well, I need to get the dimensions of the bridge and do this and do that and do the next thing. So he said, okay, fine. Uh, he gave a set of orders to one group who then went into Zambia on a quick recce to determine what were the sentries and so on and so forth and the defensive positions on the bridge at Toma. Um, Dare I say it, at that time, uh, in, in the Decker camp itself, uh, my bed was next door to Edward Perengondo and we were chatting away about various bits and pieces and everything. And he was quite interested in explosives, but uh, at that stage he knew damn well he was not coming on, on this trip. These guys came back and said, well, there's limited defense there. I can't remember exact figures and that, whatever it was. Um, and then Butch said, okay, well, let's give it a, a day or two and then we can take you in and you can get your measurements. And I said, okay, fine. He said, there is a problem though. We've been told there aren't any aircraft available in Matabili land. Uh, so what do you mean there's no aircraft? In the event of a Kazovac, there's not a helicopter. There's not this, there's not that, there's not the next thing. In the event of any support needed, absolutely nothing is available. And we said, oh, we didn't know Op Uric was about to take place. Hence, that's why there was no support uh, in Matabili land. So a couple of days later, we crossed over into Zambia. We were on our way. Um, and the next thing we were told, uh, abort, 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 come back. So about turn all the way back. And the police boats that had dropped us, picked us up. We came back and I sort of said, well, what the hell is going on here? Uh, what is happening? And Butch then said, you know, there's a, there's a call sign that's been after you. Uh, you need to get on there, but there's been a big punch up in Mozambique and things haven't been very clever. And I said, oh, okay, like what? Then we got the message on Op Uric and what had actually happened. And when I got back to the radio room at Decker, uh, I radioed back to my squadron headquarters in Bulawayo and said, I believe you've been trying to get hold of me. And they said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we've got a few uh, messages to let you know. And they were trying to give it in veiled speech that we've lost some guys in action. And I said, well, I'm not sure what the hell you're talking about. Eventually, I just said to them, doesn't give it to me in clear. And they said, right, Burns, Dubly, Jones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all dead in action. And I thought, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Then he said, and also your mate Small. So I knew Charlie Small because he'd taken these guys down to Op Uric. We didn't know the extent of the casualties in terms of um, how many are alive. We didn't know it was a puma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, then when we got the message as to exactly what had transpired down there, our little op was called off and Butch just said to me, hey, we're all getting the hell out of here. Uh, you may as well go back to Bulawayo and we'll, we'll head back to Nkomo. So then we got the story as to exactly what had happened down there. But there was now the second highest casualties that the Corps had suffered in any one go. Terry, tell us about Leroy Dubley. Um, he was supposed to have a rugby game, poor guy, um, and it didn't work out, but just a bit of background. Interesting, and I mean, it's in the book, The Search for Puma 164, with uh, Rick Van Molson and the late uh, Neil Jackson wrote. 
when I was at Decker prior to doing the recce on the Choma Bridge, uh, suddenly the radio operator from Scouts called me and said, hey, uh, somebody from Army Headquarters wants to speak to you. What the hell does Army Headquarters want to speak to me for? Go and get your whole fast rep because that's the appointment title for engineers. Anyway, I got on the radio and this guy said to me, uh, we've had Brian Murphy around here. He's ranting and raving. You've called up uh, the Rhodesian fullback, Leroy Dubley, and he's apparently on ops and Rhodesia is playing Natal uh, that Saturday and they want him back. Uh, I said, okay, let, whoa, uh, I'm not aware of what's going on here. Let me try and find out what's happening. So by then I'd, no, I'd been notified that call it the S2 guys were down in Chiredzi and I managed to get hold of Leroy on the radio and said to him, hey, listen, uh, you know, you're causing me bloody grief here. I need you out of there to come back to Bulawayo and you're going to fly out with the Rhodesian rugby side and everything else. And he said to me, please understand where I'm coming from. Rhodesia has not won a game this season. This is our last game. I doubt if we're going to win it. And I'm with my mates here. And in 24 hours, we're going on an op. We don't even know what it is or anything. We are so keyed up and geared to go. Please tell them you can't get hold of me or it's impossible for me to come out from where I am. I said, okay, okay, your call. So I got back to army headquarters and I just said, hey, uh, doubly unobtainable, this, that, and the next thing. So there is, and it's, as I said, it's written in the book, there is one of the guys, some shouldn't have been on the chopper, some should have been on the chopper. Leroy should not have been there. And yes, that Saturday, Rhodesia went down to Kings Park to play Natal. There was a two-minute silence before the game. A bugler sounded the last post and Ravelli. Everybody lined up and a game of unbelievable intensity, if I can put it that way, was played. And let me get the figures here. Rhodesia won the game 1915. <laughs> Several years later, when I'd moved back to South Africa, I was in a sports shop in Peter Marisburg, and in the sports shop was a lovely lad by the name of Laurie Sharp. And we're chatting away about various bits and pieces and everything, and he said to me, oh, I was playing for Natal in that game. I said, you were? He said, yes, yes. I knew his brother, Toffee Sharp, very well. And I said, okay. He said, we knew we had an intense game. He said, the two-minute silence, the bugler and everything, the Natal guys were lined up and they were whispering to each other, guys, we are going to have war on our hands here. He said, the intensity of the Rhodesian players you just had to be there to behold, to see what it was like. Midway through the second half, there was a, for whatever the reason, uh, a break in the game and everything. The Natal guys got together and they said, we're not going to win this game. We're not going to win this game. They're doing it for Leroy. And I mean, while I'm talking, I'm getting this spirit. We're doing it for Leroy. And that's what's going to happen. And that's exactly what did happen. And yes, it was the only game won that year by, by Rhodesia, the last game. But going back to Leroy, he was capped 42 times for Rhodesia. He debuted in July 1973, scoring a total of 83 points, made up of seven tries, 11 conversions, and 11 penalties. Um, should he have been in Kings Park playing? Yes. Was it his decision not to? I say it was. Um, and fate has a very funny hand when he wants to deal the cards out. After the tragedy of Op Uric, uh, there were services held all around the country. And the memorial service head in Bulawayo at St. John's Cathedral, uh, it was standing room only. And outside were people. And pretty much the entire Rhodesian rugby side came down to pay tribute to all the fallen, but particularly to Leroy. And it was just... It was just so emotional. As I say, there was no standing room in that church whatsoever. But the Rhodesian rugby side, who were predominantly uh, from Mashonaland, came down. And yes, the emotion was unbelievable there at that memorial service. Very, very sad. Very brave man. And uh, he, was, he was a formidable tackler, as I remember. A deadly tackler. Fierce. Just to continue... Uh, on that 
on that day when the memorial service was held, um, I met the late Pete Fox's wife, Lynn, who is better known as Chinky, and she was eight months pregnant at the time with their only child. Um, we kept in touch, as I tried to with a lot of other people for years later. Unfortunately, she succumbed to COVID in November last year in the UK, where she had been living for about the last 10 years. She'd gone over there to join her son, who I didn't really know. But effectively, the let's go back to the task of the engineers on Op Uric. Uh, prior to the helicopter getting taken out, uh, Charlie Small took those guys from one squadron S troop uh, with Alistair Cameron. He was a, a regular subby there. And they took out that one bridge. Now, the SAS, in the meantime, were taking out all the other bridges. And I can come back to right at the beginning of when we started this recording. The School of Military Engineering was responsible for the training of all sorts of not only local engineers, uh, combat wise, but obviously other people, other units, and so on. Now, Vic Thackeray. Uh, ran a course in 1978 over a couple of months for the SAS, particularly for the SAS. There was one officer, Mac McIntosh, and 21 other ranks on that course. Uh, and he ran the course in Salisbury. The two assistant instructors were Keith Sampson and Charlie Small. Effectively, the SAS, all their demolition work uh, dare I say, their training had come through from the engineer side. And a classic example of that is Rob Warwicker, uh, who was highly efficient with the use of explosives. And he took out the, uh, the bridge over the Pongui River on Op Eland. He was often uh, at our school chatting away to his good mate, our then RSM Bert Lang, um, and expanding his knowledge of explosives and things, including being with CAD Tony Simon and Bush, and Bush Sutton. So what I'm getting at is Vic Thackeray ran a particular demolition course for the SAS only. Uh, from the basics of demolition up to, uh, in that course, advanced demolition and bridge destruction. Vic had the plans for every single road and rail bridge, uh, uh, probably in the country, but certainly within the vicinity around Salisbury. And at, towards the end of the course, these SAS guys were tasked with a nighttime recce. Uh, he would break them up into little groups and off they would go and do what the SAS do efficiently, clandestinely go to various bridges. And Vic made them take um, chalk and they had to mark on the bridge with chalk where they would place their explosives. Obviously it was a fairly sensitive situation because here are guys running around in the middle of the night, climbing up and down and over bridges and things. So uh, security had to be paramount here. Then in the morning, they come back to where Vic was running the course in Salisbury, discuss various aspects, and then they would do the calculations with the students to determine whether they had correctly ascertained the amount of explosives for that bridge, that bridge, or whatever it is. Then they would go out, and uh, <laughs> Vic would get these guys with the chalk to show him exactly, now it's daylight, where would they have placed these explosives at night? So... He put them through their paces. Um, and dare I say, there was a very good relationship between the SAS and the engineers, particularly where there were things like uh, running these courses. Um, and between Vic, Keith Sampson and Charlie Small, they trained up the SAS guys who then did the bridge demolition work on Op Uric. So there was always a close liaison between particularly Charlie Small and the SAS guys. And I remember on the one occasion, one of the guys said to me, the SAS, not being derogatory, put the demolition charges on the bridge, detonated it, and the structure was still intact, but the, it had degraded somewhat afterwards. They went and told Charlie, and Charlie said, oh, for goodness sakes, I trained these guys. Didn't they use the PP formula? And the guy said, what is the PP formula? He says, put plenty. <laughs> Get what you've calculated, add some more to it. So, yes, the liaison between the engineers and the SAS was always a, uh, a good one and always humorous in certain respects. But, and I spoke to Graham Wilson 
after the one Puma ceremony up in uh, Joburg a couple of years ago, uh, and he wanted to contact Vic Thackeray. But yes, the SAS guys on that op had all been trained by Vic, Charlie Small, and Keith Sampson. Terry, you uh, earlier you mentioned um, Edward Pirangondo uh, from yes. the Sioux Scouts. Um, as the war wound down, there were efforts made using explosive devices to kill um, some of the enemy leadership. Um, can you go into a bit more detail about that? Uh, again, sort of not dissimilar to going up to Decker to join Butch Duncan uh, on the Chama Bridge scenario. I get an instruction, um, get up to Andre Robby Barracks, uh, they need you there. What for? I don't know. Anyway, I get there and I'm then briefed. Um, the powers that be, and I stress that in inverted commas, have decided that the terrorists must be viewed as being anti-Christian. Uh, I said, okay, what are you getting at? No, you must now go and make up some bombs that can get placed in the various churches around Salisbury and they will detonate and there will be the evidence that the terrorists are anti-Christian. Um, I won't tell you what I thought about it and I won't tell you what other people thought about it. Um, so I said, okay, where to from here? And went round the corner and grabbed a wad of money out of the slush fund at Andre Robby Barracks, put on some civilian clothing, disappeared into Salisbury in an unmarked civilian car, and then went and purchased four dog bag hold all things, one from this place, one from there, one from there. But four of those Zorba alarm clocks. Again, not from the same store, one here, one there, one there. Uh, because the instructions given to me were three of the bombs will detonate, one won't. Thereby, the evidence is irrefutable that it is a terrorist bomb. So off to the uh, armory and collect genuine terrorist kit and equipment, be it uh, slabs of TNT, mortar bombs, you name it so that the makeup of the bombs, if there was one that was not going to detonate, not the one that was determined, designed not to detonate, anyone else there would be the evidence there that these are uh, terrorist activities. So I set about making up these four and used the Zorba alarm clock as the mechanism, um, batteries, this thing, that thing, and I won't go into the details, but effectively uh, through the glass of the clock, put a safety pin, if I can put it that way, the our hand was removed, so you only had the minute hand, and there was various other aspects. The safety mechanism, I believed, was way beyond what was necessary. Then I'm introduced to the guys who are going to take these bombs, and uh, I won't give you their names, other than the fact that we, we were now broken down into four groups, obviously, because there's four bombs. And in came Edward, uh, and we chat, 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 hello, how are you, and everything. And with him was a chap called Corporal Moyo. And we're discussing things and everything, and I said to one of the guys, what are Edgar, uh, Edward and, and Moyo here? No, this is going to be the church at St. Mary's, if I remember correctly. So it's in the townships there. I said, okay, fine. So we all sat down and we went through the arming mechanism on these bombs. And we must have gone through it a dozen times, 15 times, 20 times. And I said to the guys, when we go out with these bombs, we've got to make sure it's going to be dark. Got to make sure we know exactly what we're doing. So guess what? You are now going to do the arming and disarming with a blindfold. And they were sort of like, whoa, hang on a second. I said, unless you can do the disarming and arming with a blindfold, you're going to battle to do it at night. So I got the guys to do that. That night, off we go for the placing of the bombs. And as we all know, unfortunately, the vehicle that Edward, which is his own vehicle, I don't know why, the vehicle that Edward and... <coughs> Moyo uh, were in out towards the church, two o'clock in the morning, massive detonation and destroyed the vehicle and killed them. Supposedly a African gent who was on his way home at two o'clock in the morning or something had walked past the car and was on his way down and he was called in the next day because they were looking for witnesses and he said he saw the internal light in the vehicle burning. What was going on? Why were they doing it? Who knows? Nobody knows. Only Edward and Moyo know. The bottom line was there was so much evidence from 
what was left of the vehicle and I believe a checkbook of Edwards. They said, hey, who are you trying to kid? This is not terrorists who got blown up here. These are Sleuth Scouts. That was the unfortunate death of Edward. Um, Terry, uh, after that, um, you were involved in the, after the ceasefire, the Intambali conflict that erupted uh, with Zipra now trying to um, take over Bulawayo. Um, just, just tell us a little bit about your involvement there. Uh, okay, the, the gist of that was um, I happened to be back in Bulawayo at, at my squadron headquarters, as it were. The next thing I get a message, uh, Brigadier Mike Shute wants to see you. So <laughs> I get in my vehicle and I go down to brigade headquarters. I walk in there and there's two gents in civvies. And he said, I want to introduce you to, one was definitely Dumisa de Bengua, and I cannot recall the name of the other guy. I said, okay, hello. He said, this guy's in charge of Zipper, obviously, and this guy's in charge of Zanlo. I said, okay. He said, you know, they are being housed out at Entombani. Uh, yes, I think the whole of Bulawayo knows it because they have a go at each other every now and again. Um, and there's, it's like fireworks. So he said, okay, we've had a discussion here and it's a compromise. We're trying to lower the tension, lower everything and, and stop all this conflict going on. I said, okay. He said, I want you to select a few guys and go in there and disarm these guys. I thought, no, 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 hang on. I haven't heard this right. <laughs> I said, come on, sir, you've got to be joking. He said, okay, let me rephrase that. The agreement is that the Zipper and Zanla guys can keep their personal weapons, but everything else, be it mortars, RPG-7s, whatever, is to be removed. They're refusing to hand these weapons in. So I've told Domisa de Bengue and this other chap, uh, I'll get my engineer squadron commander down here. This is a typical job for, uh, for a sapper to do, and they will go in and do the necessary. Now, here the two of them are, you need to discuss it and see where you go from here because it's between you guys and I'm just going to wish you well. And of course, in my mind's eye was cheap as how the hell are we going to walk into, you know, this is Daniel into the lion's den, uh, two conflicting terrorist organizations that can't even agree with each other. And here is the unwelcome third enemy, the Rhodesian forces coming in. Anyway, I said to them, okay, I'm going to be coming in tomorrow morning, let's say 10 o'clock. Yes, I need you to be outside and we knew there was two call it uh wired off enclosures with zipper in one zanla in the other i need you to be present right there at the front of the gate i will come in and i knew in my empty yacht i had a, an old saber land rover which wouldn't be used on ops because it wasn't mine protected i'm going to come in totally exposed in a land rover with a driver behind me will be an armored crocodile in the crocodile i'll have a dozen guys they're the guys that are going to go out there and, and look for these weapons, kit and equipment. Yes, I need you to ensure that your guys are aware this is under instructions and that you agree to what's going on. Further to that, I want to see them in the old proverbial three straight stripes. They're standing there with their personal weapons. Anything else that they don't have is not classified as a personal weapon. Yes. Mike Shute then said to me, I don't know how you're going to get out of there if all hell breaks loose. And I said, well, not away, but what I would like, if it's convenient, please, I'd like two Hunter aircraft, fully bombed up, fully loaded with all their kit and equipment. And I love the expression, loitering with intent, <laughs> straight above in Zimbani. And I'll have radio comms with them. And if all hell breaks loose, those hunters must just come in and flatten the place. And to Mr. De Bengo and the other chap, and I said to him, now you are aware there's going to be two hunters upstairs. They will be at an altitude you won't see them and you won't hear them. So it won't frighten the guys on the ground. So again, speed things up a bit. I put the guys into the crocodile and I made sure they were dressed as neatly as possible with rifles. I'm in the Sabre Land Rover, beret, stable belt, rifle down on the floor and an A63 radio and my driver, beret, stable belt. And off we go to Entombani. As we come round the first corner, you can see the, 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 the group in that, call it enclosure, had pulled up the wire, had come out from underneath the wire and had dug shell scrapes and slit trenches outside the perimeter fence. 
did we get a welcome? Like hell, we got a welcome. They didn't physically point any of their weapons at us, but you could see they were not happy that we were basically coming there to do the job that we've been told to do. I get to the first, whichever it was, Zipper or Zana thing, meet the guy there. I said, okay, fine. You understand what's going on? Yes. Got my guys outside the back of the crocodile and I warned them they all must have their rifles on a sling. So they had both hands free because we were not going to go in totally unarmed. And they must now go through and search the place and bring out anything that was seen to be nothing more than a personal weapon because the other guys were all uh, on parade as it were with their personal weapons. So we did the first lot. Uh, and I said to, let's say it was Dumisa, I said, I better go and talk to the hunters just to let them know that everything is all right. Unfortunately, first thing in the morning, Mike Shute said to me, the Air Force can't release two hunters. They're not available. I said, well, whatever you do, do not tell the two of them that there are no aircraft upstairs. Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, it's a psychological thing. Let them think there are two hunters upstairs. So I said to him, I need to just go and talk to the hunters to tell them everything's all right. Yes, please do, please do. So I pretended I'm on the radio talking to the hunters. And they told them, hey, there's two aircraft up here. We then go to the next section. Same story, all lined up, go through. There was some very terse verbal comments coming from these guys. These would have been the zipper guys because my driver was a Matabili and he was translating for me. And I just said, hey, we're not going to rock the boat. Anyway, we collected as what we could. Did we collect everything? I am damn sure we missed a lot of things. But I think the, the aspect here was your sworn enemy has been into your midst with the authority of your two commanders yeah. and we've acted sensibly and we've acted non-aggressively. Um, came out, headed back towards uh, Brady where obviously one brigade headquarters is. I told the guys to take all the kit and equipment down to the magazine and then I went to report to Mike Shute <laughs> and Mike Shute laughed. He just said, you know, this is this has got to go down in history. There's Zipra, there's Zanla and there's Rhodesia going in and giving the instructions and telling them this, that, the next thing. How did the story on the hunters go down. I said, I just told them I had to go and talk on the radio to confirm that they were all there. And when we were about to leave, I said, I've given them another five minutes. We're leaving here. In five minutes, they will return to Thornhill. Within about two or three days, they had a full go at each other again. And I mean, a full go, uh, half a bull away, I used to get a couple of beers and things, drive out to a given point, sit down, meet all your mates and watch all the, all the bun fight that was going on up there. <clears throat> I then left the army and left Rhodesia uh, in the following, Feb in that February. And it was shortly after that, that the Battle of Bulawayo took place, which was efficiently handled by, handled by the CO1 RER, then Mick McKenna, where the armored car lad took out that uh, other armored vehicle and the guy got a bronze cross of Zimbabwe. Lionel Dyke got a silver cross of Zimbabwe from the Alamo incident and everything else. But I had just left the country then and I thought, well, yeah, they must just, just get on with it now. Terry, as you know, um, although not many people grasp this fact, but it was actually the Rhodesian Army and Air Force that saved Mugabe. Uh, without, that, Very much so. without that intervention, Mugabe probably wouldn't have survived that um, Zipra assault. So uh, no, we didn't do ourselves any, any favours that day. I mean, with the armoured column coming up on the Essex Vale Road into Bulawayo, um, and as I said, highly efficiently run by the RER, commanded by Mick McKenna. I understand at a later stage, somebody went to Mugabe and said, hey, you've got to say thank you to the extradition, uh, now extradition troops and everything who saved your bacon. And he was well aware, well aware, that basically uh, the Rhodesian troops had saved the day there for him. He didn't he have a funny way of showing his appreciation. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, no. But as I say, those were amongst the first Medals yeah. of Zimbabwe that were then uh, given out. The, I know the Ahmed Khali had got a bronze cross, as I say, and Lionel Dyke, one of the first silver crosses of Zimbabwe. Gary, um, were you involved in, in clearing the minefields after the end of hostilities? Yes, the, uh, call it, as you mentioned earlier, call it at the time of cessation of hostilities, prior to independence, when everybody, let's say, a bit of sanity started to prevail, I was given the instruction to clear vast sections of the minefield up at Vic Falls. Now, going back to call it the bridge demolition at the falls, in conjunction with that as a defense for the falls, there was a perimeter minefield around Vic Falls. Um, 
that was situated about two kilometers away from closest habitation because we worked on the basis of a 60 millimeter mortar without a base plate. Boom, it was, it was not going to exceed two kilometers because that's what the, the terrorists were using at the time. It basically a handheld 60 millimeter mortar without the base plate. So the falls was pretty much encircled from the river all the way through the Kazangula Road round uh, with a minefield. Now, uh, there's plenty of stories prior to that about animals being trapped in it and so on and so forth, but we were now to open up as much of it as we could for tourism and so on and so forth. So I was tasked with clearing that part of the minefield and after due discussions with uh, various people and then even my then uh, Squadron Sergeant Major Vic Hydes and various other people, the idea was we will control burn and uh, not to let the fire get away from you. With a controlled burn, the fire produced sufficient heat to activate a detonator, which means the detonator in anti-personnel mines and the detonator in the plowshare should be activated so that they are now neutralized. We would then go back in with an armored bulldozer and mark a given area. And once we believed the, certainly the plowshares, those that hadn't been detonated by the, by the fire, we'd go in with a rifle and we would shoot them. So that area there, it, was, it wasn't a very large area. You would demarcate it and then the armored bulldozer would come in and run up and down, up and down, up and down, back to front, back to front, back to front. And I've got a couple of photographs of actually the bulldozer detonating anti-personnel mines, which obviously had no effect on a machine that big and that heavy. Um, so we managed to clear certain sectors which allowed more freedom of movement for animals particularly. I am aware of two incidences where buffalo detonated an anti-personnel mine after we had supposedly cleared the area, but it looked like the mine may have got washed out of the thing there. Now at about this time, um, army headquarters got a hold of me and said, oh, you, you got some guests coming up to the falls. Uh, please look after them and see what you can get out of them. And what the hell is going on here? A delegation from the UK arrived that was commanded by a, a half colonel uh, and a couple of NCOs, and they'd come from the Royal Engineers in the UK as part of the agreement between Rhodesia and England. These guys had come out because they'd been working uh, British Army of the Rhine and in Europe and things, call it bomb disposal, this thing, that thing and everything, and they were highly knowledgeable and experienced in demolitions. They were coming out to help advise us on how to clear the minefield. I forget the name of the half colonel, very pleasant man. Anyway, after a few days, a delegation arrived from army headquarters to see what was going on. And there's this half colonel with a, I think it was three NCOs. And we're sitting at the, uh, call it the tent at Sprayview airstrip at the falls, discussing things at lunchtime, going through everything. And it just says, so Colonel, um, have you managed to pass on some advice to the uh, local engineers here? And he said, no, absolutely not. In fact, he said, I've picked up quite a good few tips since I've been here. And I said, really? He said, what you guys are doing here and how you're clearing and the method of clearing, we couldn't produce anything better, but I am seeing how things are done in Africa from an African point of view. He says, I'm used to what goes on in Europe. And now I have to understand that things are very different here. And we had, for example, discussed fuel air explosive. Now that's like a gas cylinder, open the thing and out goes the gas. You detonate it in the air and there's a big explosion. That's a simple way of putting it. But it may work in Europe. It's not going to work in Africa. The heat from the ground, the heat here, there, if the gas dissipates too much, it's not going to detonate. So he was pleasant enough to say, Her Majesty's government has paid for a very pleasant holiday for me and these other guys to come out to Vic Falls. Thank you. No, there's nothing we can advise the Rhodesian engineers on. And we are taking a few ideas back with us. We eventually cleared a large portion around the falls. And then obviously, Long after I'd left, there was the mine tech and various other organizations that were clearing minefields around the whole country. Terry, just in closing, um, uh, just mentioned some of the guys that, that were decorated within the uh, Corps of Engineers and some of the other um, stats that you'd like to mention. The, I remember speaking to Mike, Mike Pelham after he'd been justifiably awarded his OLM. Um, and there was a sort of a, a comment of, geez, you know, there's, there's only a couple of engineers that have been decorated and everything. And uh, 
not only his attitude, but the attitude of so many was, well, I'm just doing my job. I mean, you know, what for? Um, I won't mention his name because he'll be embarrassed. A very well-known senior NCO was given an MFC for an op that he did up at Kariba, putting in a minefield there. He pretty much refused the MFC and said, I'm not interested. I was only doing my job. So that was the ethos within the core was, uh, you know, you're just doing your job. You're doing what you've been trained for. This is a, a chap who was under my command in, in, in one engineer squadron, the chap by the name of Sergeant Vincent. Sergeant Vincent initially worked as a civilian plumber's assistant in the Rhodesian Corps of Engineers. He joined the Corps on the 1st of June, 1973, and without any type of training, continued as a plumber's assistant, but this time as an African soldier. Because you must remember, obviously, going back to the, the core thing there, we had tradesmen. They were not combat engineers. There were electricians, there were plumbers, there were all sorts of people who were tradesmen that uh, supported the Corps. Sergeant, he then became a driver. At no stage had he had any formal infantry or combat training. He then came to me and requested a transfer out of trade wing into call it combat wing. And I said, okay, but you, you're not knowledgeable and you're not experienced, but basically go to the field and then we will do the training later, if I can put it that way. On the 24th of May, 1978, Sergeant Vincent was called by a patrol to investigate an explosion, simply because he was the highest ranking guy there. Voices had been heard prior to the explosion indicating a possible terrorist presence. Without hesitation, Sergeant Vincent took complete control of the situation and led a team of engineers recently out of their three months training into the area. Sergeant Vincent moved to a position where it was evident that a terrorist had been severely wounded in the previous contact. Several items of terrorist equipment were recovered at the scene of the detonation. After careful reconnaissance, Sergeant Vincent located tracks and led the follow-up for a further 90 minutes before his group was ambushed by the terrorists. As the contact progressed, Sergeant Vincent showed great skill in deploying his men to the best possible positions. This he did, although under fire from a well-sighted terrorist ambush, in difficult, heavy, wooded terrain and outnumbered by the terrorists. Just remember, this guy's had no combat training. He's just come from trade wing as a plumber's assistant and driver. He then skirmished forward himself to an area which he considered the most dangerous and with his own rifle fire neutralized the machine gun that was actually firing on the group. The terrorists then appeared to be breaking off the engagement and he ordered his own machine gunner to outflank them. But unfortunately, in the thick vegetation, uh, the terrorists managed to break out. Due to failing light and thick vegetation, Sergeant Vincent detailed that no further actions to take place, etc., etc., etc. For a man with limited training, Sergeant Vincent displayed marked common sense, a desire to kill the enemy, extreme bravery, in exposing himself to fire. Later investigations revealed that he had severely wounded the RPD gunner, which at least led to the fact that nobody else was injured there. I wrote that citation and I put it up to Army, and my recommendation was an MFC. Shortly thereafter, Mike Pelham gets on to me and he says, listen, the medals committee has been on to me, your citation for Sergeant Vincent. I said, yes. Can we go through it over the phone? I said, yeah, we can. He said, really, do you assess that everything was, let's say, from his own initiative and everything? I said, absolutely. He had had no formal training yet. It wasn't long after this, he then went on combat training and everything. Um, he said, well, the medals committee want to know if you would object to them pushing it up to a bronze cross from an MFC. I said, hey, I have no objection to that at all. I'd rather that than we put it in for a bronze cross and they down it to an MFC. This is where about 15 years ago, my good friend Craig Furry, who you also know, said to me, Sergeant Vincent's medals have just been sold on the internet. They were bought by a collector in Japan. Who knows? I have no idea. Then to continue with, we, we did decorate, and I say we, we put up decorations for a lot of medics who were working on the minefield. Uh, one of them is Bert Sachs's brother, um, Corporal Theodore Leslie Sachs, Rhodesian Army Medical Corps. Corporal Sachs was attached to the Rhodesian Corps of Engineers who de deployed on mine laying tasks in the operational area on the 7th of July, a member of the mine laying team stood on and detonated the mine. Corporal Sachs, without thought of his own personal safety, moved into the minefield, rendered first aid to the injured soldier. There is no doubt that whilst assisting the injured soldier, Corporal Sachs was himself in danger of detonating a mine. His courage and devotion 
to his job was outstanding and his eagerness to assist the injured has helped to maintain high morale amongst those he served. There are various other MFCs and then there is a bronze cross that we nominated a Corporal Francis Gavin Price, a medic, and he got a bronze cross for similar actions which took place in the minefield where the medics went in, uh, dare I say, without batting a line to help the injured. And those incidents are well recorded. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, um, but they are indicative of, dare I say, the engineers recognized people, particularly in the medical corps for the work that they did uh, and how they supported us. There would have been a lot more serious injuries without these medics that we, we had. We, uh, to us, going to the minefield without a medic was like a convoy going without a pookie. We, we wanted a medic and they were um, well treated and well looked after because you knew damn well if you needed a medic, you wanted the guy there. Hello story, T. Thanks. Um... As I say, I think you've filled a very large gap in uh, putting together this history of the war because you guys certainly played a huge role at um, and were exposed to enormous risk. So I'm pleased we've had the opportunity to do this. Thank you. May I finish off on these ones? A lot of people within the Corps will remember our friendly American by the name of Bob Cox. Uh, you'd hear him on the radio, you hear this, you hear that. Bob joined us, um, I can't remember the exact time, but he'd ex, obviously American Army, been in Vietnam and everything. And he came with an orthopedic boot. Um, be that as it may, he was very active in the minefield and various other places. And he is one of the first recipients of a Silver Cross of Zimbabwe. And I've got his citation here, which I would like to Captain R.K. Cox received the Silver Cross of Zimbabwe on the 6th of December, 1981. His citation still evokes sympathy and admiration when, after being told that a man had detonated a mine and was lying in the minefield on the 7th of December, 1981, it was already gathering dusk and Cox himself already a landmine victim amputee. He'd been in the minefield before pulling a guy out and detonated a mine and had had his good leg amputated there. Uh, or a section amputated, having been blown up twice before, decided to assist in extricating the injured man uh, and in the process detonated another mine, that's Bob did, receiving injury to the iron leg but managed to get both of them out. The remaining mines are taking a heavy toll on newcomers to the mined area, uh, blah, 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 being the last touch of the group's corner, da, da, da. there was another guy, a Mr. Hildebrand in Burma Valley received a bronze cross of Zimbabwe for exceptional bravery when he lost a leg, saving a landmine victim. Now, Bob Cox and Lionel Dyke were two of the first recipients of a Silver Cross of Zimbabwe. So there's Bob with an orthopedic boot and a part amputated leg, having been into the minefield a couple of times already helping people. No qualms to go in and help this guy. Unfortunately, shortly after he left the army, joined a civilian organization to lift mines, was working in Mozambique. I don't know the whole story. He was in a Land Rover, unmine protected, drove from A to B over a mine, it detonated and it killed him. I actually remember the uh, Pa Hildebrand story because I oh, very, okay. very old old friend. And um, yeah, if I remember correctly, I, well, I remember when it happened, but I think he was named Charles, but he was always known as Pa, in, very much with us in Australia. But he was, oh, Mr. Ordered, he, he was ordered into the minefield by um, the new army, by ZNA uh, personnel uh, to go in there for some reason. And when he, when, when Pa hit the mine, stood on the mine, these guys all just, just uh, left the scene. They, they ran away and he had to look after himself. And, and I think Pa actually drove himself home, um, you know, with one foot dangling off off his leg and then made his way to hospital, but it was a it was a, a sad day. So yeah, I remember. I remember. He, he got a bronze cross of Zimbabwe. Okay, I, I didn't actually know that, but um, yeah, well, I've got a part of the citation here. Um, 
they certainly need to finish off, as you mentioned, their stats on the Corps of Engineers. Um, don't want it to be seen as a, a negative in any way, but I often get asked sort of two questions. How long was the minefield? That's the first one. Uh, what are the stats on casualties within the Corps? Now, I stand to be corrected. And I've researched, researched, and got my good friend Craig Free to confirm various things. As it stands, this is what I have. The Corps suffered 63 deaths in total, 16 killed in action, and 47 killed on active service. Further to that, a further 21 personnel lost one or more limbs or lost fingers or hands and were severely blinded, or I can just say blinded, severely. Included in this lot, uh, and I sent the picture there, is Charlie McQuillan, who was a bomb who'd come over and joined us, laying the mine down, center of the clod, boom, and fingers gone. Um, and he then existed with two little digits being the thumbs and things like that. Many people uh, say, what are the stats? And I, as I say, I've got figures here of plus minus 21 personnel lost one or more limbs uh, in terms of this lot. One of my African soldiers in Bulawayo, he was again laying an armed mine and the mine detonated and it severed his hands completely. The blast also blinded him. He was Kazavak back to Bulawayo and in time he had stumps for hands and blind. He then had little rubber cups made for these stumps, which had like a pencil extension with a eraser thing on the end of it. Blind as anything, but he taught himself one of those fancy fangled law typewriters. And he landed up as a court stenographer in the high court in Bulawayo with his little stumps and getting everything recorded on a typewriter. Blind as a bat. A territorial guy, Des Chandler, similar situation, the mine detonated, his hands were fine, but the blast blinded him. Um, when he had, I say, recovered, he was a past master at what I call the extending little white blind man stick. He could find his way around Bulawayo. He knew the paces between this place, that place, more the pubs than anything. Occasionally, he would pop out to our uh, All Ranks pub, the Nine Flames in Brady, and for his 21st birthday, I gave him a set of darts. He was an avid dart player and he played a mean game of darts. And you would position a chair, he would go up against it with his thighs so he knew exactly where he was and you'd let him throw the darts half a dozen times so that he could judge the height of the dartboard. He had imprinted in his mind all the numbers, the doubles, the trebles, you name it, on a dartboard. I would say he was better than average, but he played a mean game of darts. And if anybody came in that wanted to, dare I say, cause any grief or something, we'd say, hey, you go and play darts against Des Chandler, but you play under his rules. Oh, what are those rules? You put a newspaper over the dartboard <laughs> and you, the sighted guy, must now throw to the dartboard that's covered by a newspaper. Um, and of course, nobody ever beat him at that. Des eventually left Rhodesia and I followed him as best I could and he landed up at St Dunstan's School for the Blind in the UK in Sussex, not far from Seaford, as an instructor for blind people. Uh, and I sent you a lovely photograph while it was Des with his cane and his wife, Ian Smith. And Ian Smith's got his hand on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm getting at is we had some unbelievable casualties in the Corps. We had unbelievable sportsmen who achieved sporting excellence as paraplegics and things like that. Quadruple, I don't think we wanted it, but certainly Blaise Hollingworth, uh, Don Hollingworth, the uh, well-known policeman, his son had half a dozen swimming records and things, but some of the injuries were horrific because you're dealing with explosives. And that's the way the game goes if you're going to deal with explosives, unfortunately. So... Yes, just to refer back to the stats, 63 deaths in total, 16 killed in action, 47 killed on active service, and approximately 21 personnel who lost one or more limbs. Those are the stats that I've managed to find, which um, 
we as members of the core, whenever we have these services and things, we don't forget. We keep we keep our dead in our mind. We keep honoring them. And as far as I'm concerned, that is part of parcel of this session with you is to keep these memories alive. Well, well done, Terry, and um, bless the fallen and um, salute to uh, all those amazing guys who, um, who risk so much for the country. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, dare I say, as you mentioned right at the outset, just to say something about the core, because I don't believe there is enough information out there for the general public. Thanks, so Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Hannes.